Rise of the Triad, one of my favourite first person shooters, but still a game that seems to pale into insignificance compared to Doom or even Wolfenstein 3D. In many ways that seems unfair, so I felt it was time to do my bit to revive one of the greatest first person shooters of all time by covering the story behind Rise of the Triad. Developed and published by Apogee Software in December 1994, almost exactly a year after Doom, you might think that Rise of the Triad was simply a Doom clone, but in reality it was anything but. Rewind to May 1992 and id Software have just finished and released their latest development through publisher Apogee Software. This development was the pinnacle of their then current 3D engine, which had been advancing since Hover Tank 3D was released in April 1991, swiftly followed by Catacomb 3D in November of the same year. Taking these earlier releases, inspiration was sought from the 1981 stealth shooter Castle Wolfenstein to create something that would stand out, incorporating both gore and frantic action into a convincing world. The game that would emerge from this mixing pot of creativity was really a breakthrough in terms of combining engaging gameplay with a perspective we're all familiar with, first person. That game was Wolfenstein 3D. It wasn't their first game to be published through Apogee's shareware model. That honour went to Commander Keen in Invasion of the Vorticums, after Apogee approached the id guys seeking an original new game. But Wolfenstein 3D would be their first hugely successful game through this route. Under this marketing method, the first episode was released for free via various bulletin board systems in an attempt to drive interest in paying for the remainder of the game. It wasn't a new strategy, but after proving to be highly successful when coupled with a compelling game, it paved the way for many a release to come, leading to a full retail box version published under FormGen and GT Interactive. Wolfenstein 3D success quickly meant add-on packs were developed for the game. This included the Nocturnal missions and the Super Upgrades pack featuring 815 fan-made levels, with a level generator and a map editor. An extended version of the game titled Spear of Destiny was also published through FormGen in September 1992, solidifying the first-person shooter genre. Wolfenstein 3D quickly became the biggest shareware game of 92, with retail sales following at a rapid pace, whilst also causing mass controversy for its outrageous levels of violence and frighteningly realistic graphics. You got me. With all this success, it's not surprising that Apogee encouraged id to jump quickly onto the idea of a sequel. However, id weren't a company to hang about, and blessed with the evolving drive of John Carmack and Romero, they had already been working on improving their engine way past what Wolfenstein offered. At this time, Tom Hall, one of id's founders, was also heavily involved developing the engine, but was facing severe creative differences with other members of id. Tom's original design document sets the scene. Doom takes up to four players through a futuristic world to rescue your teammate, Buddy Takote. They may cooperate or compete to push back the invading hordes, and the environment is one big world, just like real life. A vision that sounds more like Left 4 Dead than what Doom would become, and the remnants of this vision are evident in some of the Doom beaters. However, this was not to be, and so Tom departed from id and moved across to work in-house at Apogee, bringing with him the Wolfenstein 3D name as a bridge project. This seemed to work fine for id as they had bigger concerns to concentrate on, and it was perfect for Apogee, who were keen to launch a follow-up for their most successful shareware release to date. Initially, this follow-on was just going to be an additional pack of levels and graphics for the Wolfenstein 3D base game, entitled Rise of the Triad Wolfenstein 3D Part 2. The demo you see on screen shows some of the actual artwork created and additional features were planned including a grenade launcher, destructible walls and even a scrolling horizon dependent on memory. But this was all quickly scrapped in favour of a full-blown sequel simply called Rise of the Triad, and it was reported by Game Developers Magazine that Apogee was creating a totally new game with new actors, new everything, but bearing the Wolfenstein name. And so work progressed. The story basis was that BJ Blazkowicz had moved on to fighting an evil organisation known as the Triad, 
who had actually been behind Hitler's domination plans from the start, and who now had developed nuclear weapons capability. This Nazi connection of course remained blatantly evident through to the finished product. One connection which didn't remain evident was the lack of Wolfenstein's name. Given that id had never officially granted Apogee to use the Wolfenstein name for future products, they quickly blocked Apogee from progressing with an official sequel. But given their good terms and Tom's connections, turned somewhat of a blind eye to the Wolfenstein engine continuing to be used. Looking at it from a detached perspective, this seems a completely fair angle to take. By now it was halfway through 1993 and id didn't want their earlier IP getting in the way of what would become their best known game of all time. For Apogee and Tom Hall, this created a crossroads situation. They weren't of course beginners in the game's market and they knew that the Wolfenstein engine would quickly be outgunned in the graphical stakes. Without the Wolfenstein IP, could this project really limp through on an engine which whilst only just over a year old, was a lifetime in terms of development progress? Plenty of Wolfenstein clones had already begun to emerge, such as Ken's Labyrinth, which added crouching, slot machines, water fountains, and various other quirks, and Terminator Rampage, which added texture mapped floors and ceilings, amongst other significant improvements. Apogee knew that restrictions of the Wolfenstein engine and the PC market it was born into were rapidly being outgrown. At its most fundamental, Wolfenstein was a real mode game which didn't require DOS memory extenders, meaning it only really needed to make use of the 640k of conventional PC memory. This allowed it to run on an unexpanded 286 machine, but also meant its engine was pretty limited, evident from the lack of texture mapping, repeated sprites and grid constrained right angle walls. The 386 and above processors allowed use of a 32 bit protected mode. This unlocked a whole swathe of extended memory, which when installed meant a game engine could be much more complicated and expansive. By 1993, 386 and 486 machines were becoming much cheaper and therefore common, so Apogee had brought Ken Silverman on board, the chap behind Ken's Labyrinth, to build a new 3D engine, which would quickly adopt the name of The Build Engine. This is of course the engine which Duke Nukem 3D would be based on. Come get some. So now we know where Duke Nukem 3D's interactive elements came from. But it was also the point which had brought Apogee to their crossroad. In one direction, they could abandon the work they had thus far completed with the Wolfenstein engine and shift the renamed Rise of the Triad to the build engine, albeit an early and unstable build engine. In the other direction, they could progress with their current work, move the project up a gear and push the Wolfenstein engine to its absolute limits. Given both the early stages of the build engine and the time they had already invested, the decision was made to continue as they were and push the engine to its limits. With Tom Hall leading the team, various developers were brought on board to work on the project. Joe Siegler had already been brought on board by the founders of Apogee, Scott Miller and George Broussard, as a beta tester on their projects, Math Rescue and Major Striker, before moving across to fill Sean Green's position as online support as he moved to id Software. William Scarborough was the first developer hired for the project and the two quickly developed a close friendship. Nolan Martin was hired to code up the menus and set up programs and Mark Docterman to act as lead programmer, along with Jim Dose who had submitted a game called Megaloman to Apogee which was never released, but would form the basis for Rise of the Triad's sound code. Under Tom Hall's guidance, one of the first tasks the team faced was converting the engine across to a protected DOS environment, opening up the memory they needed to create something substantially improved over Wolfenstein 3D. From there the world was their oyster, that is apart from some limitations of the original engine which had to persist, including having lives, when you can save the game at any point. But chief of the limitations however was the ray casted grid layout, meaning that only right angled walls could be employed, enforcing a Pac-Man like constraint. It was perhaps this very limitation which pushed the team to go practically berserk in all other areas of the game to compensate. Tom wanted to create something which stood out, and at one point sent out a memo with a message at the end stating, If we do this, we will be the developers of incredible power. This name stuck, and it would become their moniker. On December the 10th, 1993, it would unveil Doom. 
The game Tom had been a big part of was now out in the open, allowing the other developers of incredible power to see what they were up against. Doom of course introduced a swathe of improvements over the Wolfenstein engine, including angled walls, textured planes, distance shading, switches, teleporters, variable floor height, and of course the shotgun. It even left room for some homages to Wolfenstein including the Swastika control room, which was removed from version 1.4 onwards. And Rise of the Triad already had the homages coded up whether it liked it or not. The real task was somehow being able to pull its own crowd pulling improvements out of the bag. With most of the engine converted over to protected mode assembly code, Doom released and tensions between id and Apogee smoothed out, Apogee proceeded to sign a deal with id, allowing some borrowing of Doom's texture planing code into the engine. John Carmack was also kind enough to pass Mark Docterman with some sprite scaling code, meaning that the scaling routines in Rise of the Triad are actually identical to those found in Doom. In addition to Jim Dose's new sound subsystem, Rise of the Triad was really beginning to take on its own dimensions. Additional features were then piled on top including multiple levels, transparency, dynamic lighting, moving walls, destroyable objects, walls that reacted to bullets, the ability to look up and down, missile cams, stairs, and a whopping 11 player network support. Many of these features Doom didn't even have, although some were also squeezed into the Wolfenstein based engine using unconventional methods. One of these was the stairs, and multiple levels. For much of this, GADs were employed. Now, GADs were essentially interactive sprites which allowed the designers to create multiple planes within the restricted engine, and therefore commanded the award of being the first 3D action game to actually have levels directly above other levels. Some GADs rose and sank, whilst others provided a handy stairwell. What's clear is that according to Joe Siegler, they were an absolute pain to code up, and their positions had to be manually entered in hex values, for which the value sheet, known as the GAD paper, is still attached to Joe's monitor to this day. One quirk of rot was the level design utility known as TED. Now, TED was id's in-house level editor which had been used on games like Catacomb 3D and Hover Tank, but also platformers like Keen Dreams and Shadow Knights. It essentially allowed you to edit and place tiles, and although it may seem weird that it was used on both first person and platform games, Wolfenstein 3D was at its heart just a 2D game that was projected to appear like 3D. So it worked just fine, but just wasn't custom built for the task. Rot's somewhat Frankenstein engine even had features that their later build engine didn't have, such as parallaxing skies, fog, boulders, ricocheting bullets, touch plates, and lights that actually interacted with the environment, so if you shot them, things would get dark. On his website, Joe Siegler recounts various stories regarding testing, including the multiplayer, where they used coffee cups to act as the players for some of the machines. As if linking 11 machines in the 90s wasn't hard enough, the coffee cups acted as a trigger on each fire button so they could test whether all the screens were in sync. The multiplayer mode, known as Combat, also added the ability to send remote ridicules to other players. Waiter. These, like the in-game sound effects, were recorded through a simple computer microphone in Tom Hall's office. Some lines were ad-libbed, whilst others, like Joe's blur sound, blur. was a reference to an Apple IIGS game called The Legend of the Star Axe. <laughs> It was also decided that all characters would be digitised into the game. Along with all the guards played by members of the team, this included Loki, George Broussard's dog, which allowed for the infamous dog mode, and the deadly bark blast weapon that could literally tear people apart. The levels could also be vast, 
16 storeys high and encompassing an area of 1 million square feet, allowing for some pretty insane level designs. And that really sums up the attitude towards Rise of the Triad. Insane. Everything was designed to defy logic, to appear surreal and to just cause the user to stand up and go, what the hell is going on here? To that end, it was of course also the first game that let you fall off ledges and die, and the first game to incorporate something usually associated with Quake. Rocket Jumping Now dotted around levels were jump pads, which other than allowing for hilarious airborne shootouts, and the ability to land on and crush people, could send you careering off a cliff if you weren't careful. But when jump pads weren't available, there was the Firebomb, a weapon that sent out mushroom clouds in an X formation, but which also thrust you high into the sky when pointed down. Paired with the asbestos jacket, this allowed you to go into all manner of places unharmed. In fact, it was actually necessary to finish the last level of the game, unless you had the Mercury flying mode. And that brings us nicely onto the weapons, because they were absolutely crazy. Along with the pistol, dual pistol and MP40, your character would also carry one explosive or magical weapon. Now some people hated this limitation, but I thought it added a nice dynamic to the game, requiring some thought and decision making as you progress. Do you keep hold of the standard bazooka, or swap it for a heat seeker, which although helps to find your victims, is useless in a room filled with lava. There's also the drunk missile, which fires out five very drunk missiles. Split Missile does what you might expect, but my favourite was the Flame Wall. Again, it does what it says on the tin, but the effects are both devastating and immense fun. And that's all that these features boil down to, fun. Rise of the Triad was shaping up to be a game of immense fun. Additional weapons like the Escalabat with its volley of baseballs and the Dark Staff just added variety to this fun and carnage, with the ultimate prize being the Hand of God. This allowed you to cruise around the level firing projectiles from your hand, all whilst Tom Hall's voice is bestowed upon us. It's actually Tom doing an impression of the sounds John Romero would make whilst using the no-clip cheat in Wolfenstein 3D and causing mayhem in the levels. I guess whatever works. Another story Joe recounts is the flame war actually setting everything on fire in a level during development. Apparently the flames would climb up the gads and permanently set them alight, which made for a pretty compelling effect, but one which was sadly removed from the final game. In total, a lot of people worked on Rise of the Triad to make it a game worth buying, in a sea of first person shooters that were beginning to emerge, which was handy because Rot's timeline was a tad unfortunate. Christmas 1994 was approaching fast and Doom had launched a year prior. October the 10th 1994 had seen the arrival of Doom 2, which was then the best selling computer game of all time. Undeterred, the developers of Incredible Power were poised and ready for the shareware version of Rot to launch on December the 21st 1994. The original version 1.0 actually had a warning on load up to advise that it was a beta of sorts. Included in this beta were footstep sound effects as you paced about, which were dropped from subsequent iterations. But worse than that, none of the exit messages played appropriate sound effects. Various enemies were also cut from the entire game, including female over patrol, low guards, and strike teams. Incorporating these would have required 8 megabytes of RAM, and back then anything more than 4 megabytes was still pretty rare. But before anyone even got their hands on this beta copy, a power failure occurred on the night of the launch. And this was apparently a fairly frequent occurrence, leading to various office antics, including water rocket competitions, a photo of which ended up on the Rise of the Triad CD in the Extras directory. But nonetheless, Rise of the Triad The Hunt Begins was eventually launched as anticipated via an upload to the Software Creations bulletin board system. It's perhaps somewhat unfortunate that Heretic, developed by Raven Software, was released two days later, further adding to the growing FPS pool. But for those who understood it, Rise of the Triad received glowing reviews, 
whereas Doom was a perfectly balanced game of bliss, Rise of the Triad went, what the hell, and created something so off balance it would blind your senses. But despite this, for some, the constraints of the 90 degree wall worlds was a back step they weren't prepared to follow. The Hunt Begins is the name allocated to the shareware release, and is actually a completely separate episode serving as a prequel to the retail version. As Terradino Cassatt, member of the High Risk United Nations Task Force, you must infiltrate the stronghold that El Oscuro's followers have established on a small island in the Gulf of Santa Catalina, and shut down their operations. The gameplay is identical to the full game, although various enemies, obstacles and level designs are of course saved for the full feature. Like other shareware games, this episode acted as a sample of the game to come, albeit a substantial sample. The Hunt Begins is the episode I would first familiarise myself with back in the mid 90s. I can't remember where I got it from or who gave it to me, but it was on this floppy disk. And although I've played Doom before this game, Rise of the Triad had me hooked, albeit in a completely different way to id's Mars based Hellspawn. My friends and I would spend countless hours connecting our PCs via parallel cable and working through the 11 combat levels, which were ludicrous amounts of fun. Just sending repeated remote ridicules could be entertaining for hours. Where are you? Over here. La -da -da. But even when that novelty wore off, the various weapons, death sequences, eye-popping explosions all made for a horrifically compelling experience. It was actually the first game to obtain a RSAC rating of 4, with wanton and gratuitous violence, which further sold its appeal. And if you knew the engine killing Jibs code, you could up this to unprecedented levels. As far as I'm aware, this is also the game which spawned the term Jibs, later used in Quake and incorporated into vocabularies the world over. Even outside of multiplayer, Rise of the Triad just offered me so much to do. The game progression was of course solid, but what really kept me coming back for more was the little quirks, the crazy level names, the levels themselves, Shrooms mode, Elasto mode, these all felt like things the developers played around with and would be removed from any normal game, but not here, and the game was all the better for it. There was a wealth of secrets to find and even a vast array of utilities the game spawned, including an infinite level generator called Randrot. All this could have kept me entertained for months, and indeed it did, but there was also the full iteration of the game, available in retail form or through Apogee's shareware program. Rise of the Triad Dark War is the full game, available in various iterations, with the boxed versions going to town promoting the features. Unmatched realism, super save games, stupendous power ups. Later editions like this Kicks release drew attention to looking up and down and the eye-popping graphics, literally. We can also find the system requirements here of a 386DX 40MHz with dual speed CD-ROM, this being the CD version and VGA graphics. You'll also need 4MB of memory, although 8MB and a Visa local bus video card are recommended. Elaborating on the story set in the shareware release, the full game had various new episodes, options and quirks. The first of which you'll likely notice allows the player to select from one of five different characters, each bearing their own unique attributes. Discreetly groundbreaking at the time by offering protagonists of both sexes and a variety of ethnic backgrounds, Taradino Cassatt is immediately identifiable as our shareware guy, and he's an average Joe. Ty Barrett is a female protagonist who is also pretty average, Doug Went is built like an absolute tank, but is slower because of it, Laurie Lee Nee is fast with good accuracy but can't take many hits, whilst Ian Paul Freely is a slightly more average, average kind of guy. The character you chose would not only make a large difference to your playing style but also make a huge difference in death matches. My personal favourite was Laurie Lee Nee because in a game like this, speed counts. Some of the level traps and secrets were even designed so that only specific characters could reach them. This added a certain element of tactics which didn't require any slowdown or thought during the game, but still sculpted how your game could play out. And that is something evident from the go. I mean, Doom was quick, 
but Rise of the Triad was faster. It's really the game which peaks the FPS genre in terms of raw playing might, before we began to get bogged down with cutscenes, slower tactical play and huge load times towards the latter part of the 90s. And once you've exhausted your deathmatch needs, there were a whole array of other modes as well, including Collector, Tag and even Capture the Triad. Yes, this was Capture the Flag in an FPS well before it was implemented anywhere else. Bosses are also a large part of Dark War. The guards are fun enough, especially ones who pretend to be dead but then get up when your back is turned. No, don't shoot, no, no, don't shoot, no, please! But the end of level enemies such as General Darian, played by Steve Maines, said cool things like, They'll bury you in a lunchbox. Yeah, take that man. The boss who always stands out in my mind is Sebastian Doyle Christ. Who am I? You are Colonel Sebastian Doyle. Played by Joe Siegler. He doesn't leave his chair, which was actually just an office chair with staplers, but he is the holder of the blur line. What are you supposed to turn out like this? Blur. The final boss was played by Tom Hall, and you could lose the game even if you killed him. And this aggravated some people, but for me it just made the game stand out further. It was different, it was surprising, and it offered continuous gameplay and intrigue which kept me hooked. Rise of the Triad just oozed personality, and it was the personality of the developers behind it. You almost felt like you were in on the game's development, especially when you found an in-house joke, which left you sitting wondering what the hell was going on. One of the levels, called This Causes an Error, features moving walls. The problem with these walls is if they left the playing field it would cause an error, which had to be tracked down and fixed in TED. Now, one day Joe Selinski encountered it and shouted, I'm free! Which inspired Tom Hall to draw up an image of a push wall exiting the game. Now, rather than eliminate these errors entirely, this image was then incorporated as an error trap and a level was created intentionally to demonstrate it. Rise of a Try just didn't take itself seriously, and I love that. Even when you complete the game, you're presented with end credits which vary from version to version, and give you a further glimpse into the heart and soul of the team behind the game. This heart and soul was further compounded by Tom Hall and Joe Siegler with the launch of Extreme Rise of a Triad in February 1995, serving as an add-on pack for the main game which among the new crazy and extremely difficult levels included things such as stacked baluster crafts forming baluster towers, and the boulder vision level which had boulders rolling upstairs and flying all over the place. This was actually another quirk of the engine, as the boulders didn't understand height, so once they climbed a set of stairs they wouldn't come back down again. Now some people have suggested that Rise of the Triad would have been more successful if the game had have been made in the build engine. But for me, these engine quirks and limitations are what make the game the fun game it is, and what allowed the team to take it much less seriously than they otherwise might have. Rise of the Triad wasn't the most successful game for Apogee, and Extreme Rise of the Triad is even less well known, but it did gather a cult following and vast modification community who stuck with the game, mostly because it was so compelling. It was this very cult following that led to the 2013 remake by Interceptor Entertainment distributed again by Apogee Software, who dropped their 3D Realms name and reverted to Apogee to hark back to these glory packed days. This remake is actually a pretty faithful game, even retaining features designed to expand on the Wolfenstein engine limitations, such as the GADs, and it brings across many elements from the original that made it such a great game, including the speed. Several of the original team were also consulted on the gameplay, including Joe Siegler, and it's well worth a play, especially if you're a fan of the original, like myself. As for the original team, well, the developers of Incredible Power went on to begin production on Prey, which failed to progress in the 90s but was finally released in 2006 through 2K Games, under contract from 3D Realms, and it's scheduled for a reimagined version later this year. And the team have since pursued their own creative paths and created a variety of other games. Good morning. 
We're in deep. But for me, none as exciting as Rise of the Triad first was back in 1995. I could create many, many videos about Rise of the Triad, its features, its secrets, and the fun that it holds. And maybe, indeed, I shall. But we've come to the end of this short story for now, and it feels only appropriate at this stage to leave you with the dope fish and bid you adieu. Thank you for watching the Rise of the Triad story. Subscribe for more DOS goodness, give the video a thumbs up to help share it across YouTube, and you can even contribute to my Patreon account to help me continue doing what I'm doing. In any case, I thank you very much for watching, and I bid you a pleasant evening.